This evening, Jason Best and Sherwood Nyes, Nyes? Nice. Nice. are co-founders of Crawford Capital Advisors. Both are successful entrepreneurs and multi-year recipients of Inc. Magazine's 500 Fastest Growing Private Businesses in America, the award. Having benefited from the availability of capital pre-2008 and suffered from its absence post the collapse of the financial markets, they saw a need for a change in outdated securities laws and did something about it. Mr. Best and Mr. Neese co-founded and drafted the startup exemption. It is an exemption under the securities laws that would allow a startup or small business to access up to a million dollars of debt or equity capital from their friends, family, customers, or their community. They showed up and lobbied Congress, which is a remarkable task, to change an 80-year-old securities law despite facing special interest groups in a highly partisan Congress in Washington, D.C. After 14 months of hard work and consensus building, President Obama signed the JOBS Act, which includes crowdfunding, into law on April 5th, earlier this year, 2012. Since then, they incorporated crowdfund capital advisors which advises angel groups, venture capital, private equity, governments, and NGOs on creating successful strategies in what expert VC Fred Wilson claims to be a $300 billion per year market. They produce comprehensive crowdfund investing educational materials so that investors can decide whether crowdfunding is appropriate for their portfolios, as well as help them access the essential tools to invest safely, legally, and successfully. They co-founded and sit on the boards of the Crowdfunding Professional Association and Crowdfunding Inter Intermediary uh, Regulatory Advocate, Advocated, CFIRA, where they lead the fight to ensure investors are protected while entrepreneurs have access to the capital they sorely need to start and grow their promising companies. They are co-authors of Crowdfund Investing for Dummies, good for me, which will be released in, in, on November 27, 2012, and both hold international MBAs from Thunderbird. I'd like you to welcome to our stage Jason Best and Sherwood Neese. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming today. And we want to talk to you about crowdfund investing, but the frame we'd like to talk to you about it in is, is in this concept of being unreasonable being unreasonable about reasonable things, being unreasonable in finding reasonable solutions to problems. And because I think there's, there's the one thing that sort of sums up uh, the work that we did with in, in Washington, D.C., is really being unreasonable and not taking no for an answer and for really bringing a solution and not just complaining about a problem. So you're going to hear us say over and over again the word unreasonable because you're probably taught that reasonable is what you need to do while you're here. Well, we want you to know that it is unreasonable that this microphone might not be working. Um, it's unreasonable to, th to believe that three guys, three people that are not lawyers or lobbyists, but entrepreneurs can show up in Washington and change the law in 14 months, but we did. Jason, Zach, and I are all entrepreneurs. We're, three time, uh, we're Inc. 500 entrepreneurs. We started businesses that were in uh, spaces that were hyper growth. Um, so we know what it's like to take an idea, go out and raise capital, and, uh, and then grow that and create jobs and have an exit. We are uh, co-authors of the crowdfund investing framework, which is the startup exemption. That's what we brought to Washington, DC. Um, together, we've raised over $80 million in private equity. And uh, as mentioned, we are the authors of Crowdfund Investing for Dummies, which is available on November 27th. <laughs> and uh, we are co-founders now and board members of Crowdfund Regulatory uh, Intermediary Advocates, which is the ones that are working with the SEC and FINRA right now on the rules related to how the legislation will play out, and Crowdfunding Professional Association, which is the trade association for the industry, and it provides education for investors and entrepreneurs looking to get into the space. Um, and since we uh, launched uh, our initiative and the president signed our bill into law, we are now the proud founders of Crowdfund Capital Advisors. So the amazing things about it is, is we showed up and everyone said, don't do it. Everyone said it would never happen. 
They said the House and Senate would never agree. Don't waste your time. What can three regular guys get done in Washington? And who's going to pay for this? And we're going to tell you how we did it. But the thing we heard most often was, you're crazy for trying. And you shouldn't try. Um, and so definitely this began as a bit of a quixotic adventure and something that people don't typically try to do. But we believed that we had uh, the right idea and we believe we had the right, the right time. So our problem was, why is it, you know, show of hands, how many of you guys have given to Kickstarter campaigns? All right. Um, why can I give money away on Kickstarter? Why can I lend money to entrepreneurs in the developing world? But I can't invest in businesses I use every day in my neighborhood or in entrepreneurs that I believe in. And it's because that, that today, before this law change, was illegal for most investors. We wanted to give that right as that right is the people who are millionaires are able to do that in the past. Now everyone will have that, cap that capability. So what we did is we sat down literally at my kitchen table. We looked at the laws that existed prior. We created a framework that looked a lot like the framework that exists. And we said, we want to be able to allow individuals to make investments at prudent levels in small businesses and in entrepreneurs. We, went, we took this framework, we took it to Washington, DC, we went to the SEC, and we said, we, took, we, we met with the gentleman who runs the small business division, and he said, well, this is a pretty good idea. The problem is, uh, we don't change law, all we do is interpret what the Congress says you have to do. And so he said, you'll need an act of Congress to make this change, so good luck. So we decided, okay, we'll do it. So being entrepreneurs, you have to do things that you don't think are rational, you don't think are reasonable, and that people, many people, will tell you are impossible. That's what entrepreneurs do. And so instead of going to Washington with a, with a, with a problem, we went with a solution. We said we, can, we have a way to solve this problem. We have a way to create jobs, innovation, and entrepreneurship in America and around the world. And so we began by, uh, by literally walking around the, the House of Representatives and talking to whoever would talk to us, the staff members, et cetera, in uh, the summer of 2011. We were asked to testify in front of a House committee and talk about this issue. And really continued to lobbying. We were able to introduce a bill uh, that, that summed up our, our framework in the House. And that bill passed in November of 2011 with over 400 votes one of the largest bipartisan majorities of the congressional session. We then had to go to the Senate. Now, there's three of us. We're all self-funded. Uh, I live here, Woody lives in Miami, and Zach lives in New York. And so this is, requires over a dozen trips to Washington, D.C., and paying for it out of our own pockets. And so one of the things we had to do was we needed to get some interest in, in Washington on the Senate side. Now, we'd seen these rallies on television. And again, being naive and being entrepreneurs, we're like, let's try to make, do a rally. We never thought we'd have a million people. We never thought we'd have a thousand people, but maybe a few hundred would show up. Entrepreneurs or people who cared about them who wanted to make this opportunity available for investment. Well, the problem was it was November in Washington, D.C. It was raining, it was snowing. Uh, the wind was blowing 30 miles an hour. It was about 20 degrees outside. Uh, so it was miserable conditions. We had about 20 people show up to this rally. That was it. So we thought we had failed. What happened was, though, we had positioned ourselves, because you have to sort of register for a spot on the Capitol grounds. And the spot we picked was between the Union Station, uh, the train station, and the Capitol buildings. So all of the people who uh, were going to work in the morning, all the staffers in the Senate, had to pass directly by us to get to work. And so some of them took pity on us, because there's this sad little Charlie Brown rally, right, that's, that's sort of on their way to work. And they took pity on us, and they stopped and asked questions about it. Three of the staffers who, who stopped gave us their cards and said, look, stop by our offices. They're from three different Senate offices. Come see us, and we'll talk to you. And we talked to them about our idea, about the plan that we had. And those were the three Senate offices who co-authored the bill that was passed in the Senate. So sometimes, even when you think you're failing, even when you think it's over, it's not. Because I'll tell you, in that moment, it didn't feel like success at all. And, and, and you just have to keep going. So after we introduced the bills in the Senate, we were participated in uh, congressional and Senate hearings then. And in March of this year, the Senate passed the bill. 
And on April 5th, we were invited to the White House to watch the president sign the bill. So all in all, 460 days from the day we started to the day the president signed the bill. Now, as entrepreneurs, that feels like a lifetime, like over a year. But in reality, in Washington, that's pretty fast. Yeah, it's uh, just to that point, when we shut up in Washington and Jason and I and Zach were walking the halls of Congress, you, you don't meet other entrepreneurs on the way. You don't meet other entrepreneurs along the journey. You meet a lot of lobbyists who say it's unreasonable for you to think that you can actually do something. What is reasonable is for you to pay millions of dollars to us to help you get this done. Of course, we looked at each other and we said, well, that's unreasonable because we don't have any cash. So we had to do this journey on our own. Um, and what we learned from them is, is when you hire a lobbyist to get something done in Washington, it can take between five and 10 years to get a law passed. When we were looking at this, we thought our economy can't wait. We don't have time for jobs. Washington needs to understand that small businesses and entrepreneurs, and they're the job creators. And we have this solution that can free up capital in the marketplaces, and it's called crowdfund investing. So that's what crowdfunding investing is. It's taking, um, it's taking a large group of people, much like this room right here, and someone getting up and pitching an idea to them, and the crowd deciding, hey, do I want to pool my money together to help that person with that idea bring that idea to fruition? And that's what this framework is all about. But instead of doing it in a donation or a perk space, now you can actually own a piece of the pie. And you can actually have a vested interest in a business. So that's what we brought to Washington with our framework. Now, the, you, if you're familiar with what currently takes place, a lot of this originated with um, microfinance and Kiva. You've got a Kickstarter, or you've got the NPR model. You've, pr you've probably heard the, you know, give to NPR and you'll get a, a bag or something. These are traditional ways of crowdfunding. Even the American Cancer Society, what happens there, is a form of crowdfunding that we see happening today. What we did is we took that, the principles of crowdfunding and we merged it with seed and equity financing. And so now you can use those same principles to use the crowd's money to invest in startups and small businesses and do it for up to $1 million. And that's where the crowd comes in and the money that is going to support them. So, so this is how it works. Um, you got a great idea. You want to think, you know what, I've got this idea, I want to get it started, where do I go? Well, the reality is, is the capital markets have seized up, so if you're going to go out and look for private money, it's going to be very hard to find. Now you're going to be able to go to one of these SEC-registered websites and pitch your idea. First, you're going to have to go through a background check and make sure that you've got a clean slate. Um, it's going to include uh, social media so that you can reach out to those people that are closest to you and say, hey, if you believe in me, if you think this is a good idea, if you think this is a worthwhile investment, then give me a few dollars, invest in this idea, and let's see if together we can make something happen. Um, it's going to allow you to attract additional financing down the road. One of the things that uh, if you've ever gone out to raise capital or if you ever do and you go to private equity or venture capital or angel, they're going to want to see a proof of concept. They're going to want to see some customer base. They're going to want to see that you've generated some revenue. What crowdfund investing does, it actually puts the, the cart before the horse now and it allows you to go out and then pitch this idea and let the crowd decide whether it's a good idea to get going and they're going to come in. With that customer validation, you've now de-risked the investment for at follow-on investment. So we're going to talk about that too. Um, and uh, the beauty about this is it's Main Street financing. A lot of the problems that we're seeing in our capital markets are because the, the money that is flowing through the system does not trickle down to where it's needed most, and that's in Main Street businesses. But what crowdfund investing does is it frees, it frees up the access to capital so that those people that need capital the most that aren't in areas like Berkeley or San Francisco or New York City can actually get the capital they need from their community to help create businesses. So we'll go through some of these slides pretty quickly. They'll be available to you afterwards, but uh, to be able to leave some room at the end for, for questions, we want to kind of move through some of this content quickly. The framework is pretty simple. It's a 10-point framework. There, it was not complex. Basically, we start with small business owners or entrepreneurs raising up to a million dollars. If you're a small business owner in, in, in the U.S., a Main Street business, then the average amount of capital you need to expand your business is about $20,000. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in the Bay Area where, where I live, where we all are, I mean, people are used to raising hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars for, for building businesses. Um, and so that will give you that opportunity at, at a seed stage to raise up to a million dollars. 
the SEC is going to control and regulate all of this. The only way you're going to, the only place you're going to be able to raise crowdfunded investments is on platforms that are regulated and controlled by the SEC. Uh, so they won't be able to, because they want to make sure to reduce fraud uh, as much as possible, and, and we're focused on the same thing. Uh, accredited investors are typically people uh, who are supposed to be sophisticated investors. This rule was created back in the 1930s when only about 5% of Americans owned stock, uh, and the telephone was not in most people's homes. Uh, and so it was supposed to protect people who didn't know much about uh, how to make investments. Today, you know, with the social web and the ability to make, uh, go to your E-Trade or your Schwab account any time you want, it, information is much more liquid. And so we want to be able to broaden the ability for more people to make these kind of investments. But we also want to protect people uh, from, from investing too aggressively. And so the, the, the rules are that you can only invest up to 5% of your income if you make less than $100,000 a year. Or when you make $100,000 a year and up, you can invest up to 10% of your annual income into crowdfund investments. Finally, uh, we wanted to make sure that the industry had a voice, and that's why we started the Crowdfunding Professional Association and the Regulatory Advocates Association, because we need to be able to, the industry needs to be able to speak with one voice to both investors and, and do good investor protection, as well as, as making sure that uh, the SEC is satisfied that the ind industry is working on what they need to, to complete. Where are we headed from here? Uh, the short version is uh, this uh, crowdfunding will occur in two stages. Uh, right now, we're in a rulemaking period. So while the, the, the law has been passed in April, uh, the SEC gets the right rules to say exactly how the, all this is going to happen. So in January of next year, uh, accredited investors will be able to essentially crowdfund. They'll be able to publicly solicit for uh, investment, where you'll be able to actually s uh, go out uh, through Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, the web, other, other general media, and advertise offerings for small uh, stock offerings. And then in third quarter of next year, likely, it's an impossible to, to guarantee, you'll have the ability for uh, unaccredited investors to make crowdfund investments. So a couple of things on industry best practices, things you should be looking at if you're going to be raising money on crowdfunded websites and, as entrepreneurs or thinking about doing this. Number one, uh, you obviously want to make sure these sites have uh, good criminal and background checks uh, because that's going to be really important and required. So you have to submit to a background check for both securities fraud and criminal, other criminal activity if you are uh, going to raise money on a crowdfunding platform. You want to make sure the terms and conditions are easy to understand so people can easily make these investments. Uh, you want to make sure that the investors have the ability to, uh, to get the kind of education they're going to need to be, to be effective at making these early stage investments. Obviously very different from investing in Apple or Procter & Gamble uh, because this is the highest risk form of investment. And so it should only be limited to less than 10% of your portfolio. Uh, obviously, this is the number one, number one way people are going to raise this capital is through social media. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn uh, are going to be the ways that you reach out to your network. This is the majority of the funds, just like in Kickstarter, the majority of the funds that are going to be raised through, so, through crowdfund investing are going to be from people in your social network, your first, second, or third degree connections. And finally, congratulations, you've got the investors. Now how do you communicate with them it's through investor relations tools? And so one of the areas we're seeing a great area of opportunity now for an entrepreneur today is to create the kind of robust uh, tools that entrepreneurs will need to in communicate in real time with their investors. So um, I think there's two critical parts about what Jason just brought up. The first one is the education component. Unlike what you see on Kickstarter today or Rocket Hub, where you go there and you just look at a pitch and you decide whether or not you want to invest, the SEC, even us, when we were putting this regulation together, everyone in Washington, D.C. wanted to make sure that we were making investors smarter at this process. And so the investor education component is going to be a critical part of us making sure that people are going in with their eyes wide open. Um, and that's going to be a, a, a critical part because when it relates to this thing, fraud that everyone keeps on talking to us about. It's unreasonable for us to think that there will be no fraud. But I'll tell you what is reasonable. It is reasonable for us to believe that fraud will be very hard to perpetrate under our framework. And I'm going to tell you why. If you look at the entire bill and you look at what we did with this legislation, we put triggers in there that would deter fraudsters from trying to get in in the first place. We made it challenging for them to actually commit fraud because the barrier is raised even higher. And so these are some of the components that are in there. First off, 
before you go out for any crowdfund investment, if you're a fraudster and you want to take advantage of the crowd, the one thing that nobody wants you to know about yourself if you're a fraudster is who you are. Well, guess what? For the first time in history, we've pretty much legislated that anyone raising capital has to go through a background check, which means your name, address, social security number, date of birth, I'm in favor of a driver's license number and, and the state of issuance because the whole point is, is crowdfunding's about transparency. So we want people to know who you are, we want them to be comfortable with you, and we want them to know that you've got a clean slate so the chances of them taking advantage of you are pretty slim. That's the first thing. The second, you still need a smart idea. One of the things that's built into this legislation that is probably up there right now later on is all or nothing financing. Yes, it's at the end. You're gonna have to come up with, with something that the crowd is gonna go, hey, that's actually a great idea. I think I wanna be a part of that. I actually wanna own a piece of that pie. I think you're pretty good at that. So you have to have a good idea and you gotta have a great pitch to get it across to your crowd or you're not gonna get any money from them. Third, you need to have a strong network of people to take advantage of, okay? Crowdfund investing is about pulling all of your social media contacts, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, all of the people that know, love, and trust you most into your network to then go out and say, hey, here's a great idea. Come in with a few dollars so I can take advantage of you. Again, what we're trying to show you is it's unreasonable to believe in this framework that people are gonna go through the energy to take advantage of people that they know for an idea that is actually a pretty good idea. They might as well go out and start a business. So, the fifth one, you have to be able to respond to potentially exposing inquiries fast. On, uh, on uh, Indigo, was it Rocket Hub or one of the websites, um, Kickstarter in May, Mystic, uh, was one of the ideas that was pitched there. And it was uncovered, it was fraud that was uncovered within 24 hours. The crowd was looking at the idea saying, you know what, you're full of it. There's just no way this is an actual true concept. And they shut it down within 24 hours. So what, what, what that means is the crowd is going onto these comment sections. And if you've been on any of these platforms, you've seen where you can post a comment to the entrepreneur and they've got to respond to that comment. So you're gonna have to be able to respond to the comments that the crowd is pitching, putting up there, or you're never gonna uh, win over the credibility and confidence of the crowd for them to come in with any money. And fifth, uh, six, you have to hit 100% of your funding target or no money is exchanged. So if you go out there and say, I wanna go out for $500,000 and you um, come in with uh, pledges for $490,000, none of that money is exchanged because you've run out of time and you haven't hit your funding target. So it all goes back to the investors. So, Crowdfunding is global. I mean, it's unreasonable to expect that a law this, of this magnitude could change. One of the biggest changes in securities laws in 80 years could change here and not other places. So we've been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, in the last 90 days, we've been in Canada, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Italy, Turkey, uh, Sweden, talking about this concept with governments, with NGOs, uh, and elsewhere. This, this will change. And in fact, in Italy, they've already just, they just signed, they have two agendas, a digital agenda and a startup agenda. They just signed uh, that, and now the, their version of the Securities and Exchange Commission is working on how to make it legal in Italy. Uh, and so I think that, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but bottom line, this is a global phenomenon. This will, this will change how capital is raised. This, you know, it, this is, a lot of people talk about disruption, uh, disruptive entrepreneurship, disruptive creativity, uh, this is true disruption. Uh, this, this will change how capital is raised. This really turns it on its head and, puts, and gives you, the potential entrepreneur, the opportunity to raise capital in a way they've never been available before. So this is the why of why we got into this. You know, when you are entrepreneurs and you're used to creating businesses, you get the fact that you can create successful, success, successful businesses that create jobs. And the reality is if, is, if you do any digging into the job creation in the United States, you'll see that a good 50% of all the jobs that are created in the United States of America come from small businesses. You might think that big businesses provide the bulk of the jobs. The reality is they don't. You know why? Because Main Street America provides the majority of these companies that provide these jobs across our entire nation. Now, here's the most fascinating part about this. If you look at the capital that's available in the markets to fund small businesses, it's 1% of the available capital in the markets. So when you apply logic to this equation, 
it's not unreasonable to believe that if we can move that needle just one more percent, imagine the impact that we can have on our economy by creating jobs. So a lot of people are talking about what is the market size look like for this? What is it that you guys, uh, what did you do that's going to create the opportunity? How much capital are we going to get into the system? Well, there's been a lot of people looking at this in many different ways. <clears throat> We've got $30 trillion sitting on the sidelines in our savings account, $30 trillion. Fred Wilson, who's a very influential venture capitalist, had said, if Americans just take 1% of their savings, that would equate to $300 billion. Now, that 1%, if you're not familiar with where he's coming from with that, is if you have a diversified portfolio and you're looking to invest in a, in a high-risk investment, as Jason was saying earlier, crowdfund investments are the riskiest form of investing you can make. Startups and small businesses have the highest failure rate. We believe, however, with crowdfund investing, there'll probably be more successes because you've got a vested interest of community people behind the company. But if you just want to take that 1% money that you're already going to probably put into a, a highly risky asset, put it into crowdfund investments, it can equate to $300 billion. Now, if you look at the friends and family investing, there's $60 billion in the marketplace right now that friends and family are already deploying into the private markets. So there's, this is a pool of capital that's already out there. Um, that's going to shift to crowdfunding. And Gartner est estimates, they already looked at what they think the market size is going to be next year. They put it at about $6.2 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of opportunity. As Jason was talking about, when you've got startups and small businesses that don't need millions of dollars, but need tens of thousands of dollars to build a proof of concept, to flush out an idea, to see if there's traction for it, imagine what we can do with that $6 billion. We're also going to be coming out with our own uh, market study information on this in the next few weeks, so I think that'll be exciting to see. Just as a frame of reference, uh, last year, angel investors put $30 billion to work in startups. In, in startups. The, um, so if you want to get involved, it's easy for you to get involved. This industry has grown from 13 people at the White House to uh, 800 plus. We just had the first crowdfunding uh, conference in Las Vegas last week. It was uh, an amazing event to be around a group of people that get it, that see what we can accomplish together as, as a nation. Uh, as Jason was talking about, this is a global phenomenon. 12% of the members of crowdfunding professionals come from countries all over the world. So what we're seeing is the tipping point of something that will make a change for the, for the rest of the world, we believe. So we just want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we learned, some of the things that we believe can provide, that can be lessons for you guys to take with you in whatever it is you choose to do. Uh, you know, we're here at Berkeley, and you're one of the best schools in the world. And I, I believe you're not here being trained to be great engineers or great business people. You're here being, to be trained to be great leaders. And being a leader many times causes you to have to be unreasonable. And so we believe that these are some steps you can use in being unreasonable in, in leading successfully. First, put a stake in the ground. We, came, we went to Washington with a solution, not with a problem. By putting a stake in the ground, by taking a position, what you're doing is you're saying, I, here's what I believe. And then whoever you talk to about that has to either agree or disagree with you, but regardless, they're engaging in the debate. They can't be passive with that. And that's the, that, by, if you can engage people in the debate, that's the way to begin. Number two, show up. That's why we went to Washington over a dozen times, because you have to be there physically. So I was really jaded about this at the beginning of the process. I never believed that actually showing up in DC would make a difference or that anyone would ever talk to us. I was wrong. It was amazing how many people brought us into their offices, talked to us about it, to find out what was going on and find out what we had to say because we, had to put, we were putting a stake in the ground. And so by showing up, they really, in DC it's shocking, they really do pay attention. They really do listen to emails and phone calls. And definitely if you show up in the office, they'll see you. It's, it's I, I mean, I would have never believed it, but it's true. Sell what people are buying. This sounds kind of basic, but it, I mean, you'd be amazed at how many times people are selling things that people aren't buying. Sell, we were selling, what we were selling in DC last year and this year was jobs, innovation, and entrepreneurship. In the middle of a, of a recession with over 10% unemployment, those are things people are buying. 
And so think about it, when you, whatever proposition you're taking forward to your boss, to your, to your professor, uh, to other people in your life trying to sell something to, sell what they're buying. Number four, stay off politics and stay on policy. So it would, it would have been very easy for us to sort of align ourselves with one party or the other or, or, or sort of take some of the bait that we were offered in this whole process. The reality is if we had done that, we were just three guys, we'd have been crushed. What we did is we sort of stayed on the policy and regardless of who tried to bait us to take one side or the other, we just stayed down the middle. And that allowed us to be honest brokers through the whole process. And last, lastly, success has many fathers. So there were just three of us at the beginning of this and over the course of 14 months, uh, there became you know, hundreds of people who believed in this. And so what you have to do is embrace all those people embrace as many people as will get behind your cause and make them part of your cause. And that's how you're going to succeed. So we want to say thanks a lot for the time and we want to yield back the rest for, uh, for questions. Thanks. A lot of times ideas will change and people will repurpose or pivot their business. And uh, I guess kind of what is y'all's thoughts about how that would work? And on the same lines, like um, how do people go if I'm trying to raise money and I don't want to have a ton of investors always banging on my door asking how the business is going, how do I communicate that with them in an effective way or reject them altogether? I'll handle pivoting. You handle the dealing with the investors. Sure. <laughs> So um, that's a great question. Uh, startups are historically known to pivot along the way. It's just a common thing that happens. Uh, what investors, it doesn't matter if you're a crowdfund investor or you're a venture capitalist, they want to know what's going on, why you're making that decision, and they want to know as soon as you're going to make that decision. It's not a bad decision, and it's never going to be the wrong decision, but your job is to be transparent and informative for the people that are investing in your company as quickly as possible. The ways in which you will um, have problems is if you pivot without telling anyone. That's a recipe for disaster. You want to make sure that they, everyone goes into it with their eyes wide open and they're informed along the way. So in investor relations, huge. it's a great question and a, and a huge issue. Um, we haven't seen any tools created yet in the space, and we think that's a great opportunity for someone to take that up and, and, and to make a great tool that will do that at scale. Um, but what we believe is you, you can do and what will happen is the same tools you use to raise the money are going to be the same tools you use to communicate with them, whether it's private LinkedIn group, uh, Facebook updates, uh, Twitter feed, whatever those things may be, you can, you can use those tools to communicate with your audience. Uh, a personal example, um, Kickstarter. Uh, I've, I've, I've successfully raised money on Kickstarter for a documentary film. Uh, I've also given to a number of Kickstarter campaigns. One of the, uh, one of the campaigns uh, was, a, a camp was a campaign for a coffee pot, and, and, and it was just a particular supposed to make great coffee. So I, I, I like coffee, I, I, I bought one. The, he's late, he's four months late in delivering. But what he's done is he's given me updates and given all the investors, and he raised, he wanted to raise 15,000 bucks, he raised over 150,000. And he's given us updates on a regular basis, like every couple weeks, like what's going on? Like the molds broke, uh, the filter didn't work right, you know, whatever those things were. And he's provided photos, we know what's happening. I, I feel communicated with, I'm fine. I know I'm getting my, my, my cough pot in December now. I can live with that. And I think that, you know, is every investor a great investor? No, and I think that that's one of the things that's gonna be fascinating to watch. You're gonna see the ability for, uh, just like you've got reputation systems on Amazon and on eBay and, and PayPal, the same thing is gonna occur in crowdfunding. And so you're gonna, you're gonna look for investors that are the right kind of investors, and, and investors are gonna look for entrepreneurs who are communicative and are the right kind of entrepreneurs. They're also going, I think what we're gonna see develop out of this is people that are gonna leverage the power of the crowd once you get the capital. Because it's not just money that's coming in, it's people with a lot of knowledge and experience. So people are gonna be developing uh, tools, much like Google Groups or whatever, to help people with sales or marketing experience to come into those groups and then help the entrepreneur with specific challenges that they have there to overcome those challenges and make for a better business because they want it to be because they've got a vested interest in the success of that business. Yeah, uh, kind of building on those questions, um, do you envision or is it written into the law to have a standard lockup on the money or is it 
completely liquid? Can they resell it? And then also to your point about a rating on an investor, can you turn down an investor and say, I don't want your money, but I'll take yours? So there is a 12 month lockup. So you buy, if you buy uh, crowdfunded shares, one of the fraud protection mechanisms to stop what's called pump and dump campaigns where you sort of pump up the price and then sell immediately uh, is a 12 month hold period. And so just like in any, uh, any early stage investment, it's, it's, it's long-term capital. You're making a, you're making a you know, long-term commitment. After 12 months, uh, you have the ability to trade those shares on secondary markets. Um, and so there are already markets that are, that are preparing for that as we speak. Uh, and we think that obviously there'll be some businesses that there's a liquid market for, but I mean, you know, most uh, main street businesses, there's not really a, a liquid market for the dry cleaner down the street. So those are, again, what we'll see is we'll see, we'll see debt being used in some of those cases where people want repayment, but it, it's not a, it doesn't make sense for an equity play. Uh, you'll see revenue-based financing. Uh, and you'll also see dividend type models that'll take place where people may, may give uh, almost like a quasi perk for, for making the investment. In terms of uh, saying no to an investor, I don't know if you can outright say no, but you can, you'll, you'll probably see entrepreneurs setting lower limits. Like I'm not going to accept uh, anything lower than $5,000 or something. And that will keep out individuals from investing in their campaigns. But other than that, I don't think there's going to be um, any way to actually say no to uh, someone that wants to get in. So do you have interest rates for, well, if, I, if I'm an investor, and uh, is it a flat interest rate or does it depend on the projects? If they're riskier, then uh, I'll, I'll have more money or who decides, uh, who decides what the interest is? Okay, so there's a company out there called Somalend and they're a debt-based crowdfunding platform. And what they do is they set the interest rate based on how, um, how risk, the risk profile of the entrepreneur, the issuer itself. And so that's an algorithm that they use, I think, to calculate that. But at the end of the day, if the crowd doesn't think that the return is worth the risk, they won't fund it, and so it'll fail. Um, but, they, but they've not only seen the algorithm work, but they've seen more and more um, small businesses, really, because it, like Jason was talking about, when you've got a dry cleaner that doesn't necessarily have an exit strategy, debt is a great way for them to go because they already have revenue. They've got cash to pay for, the, pay off the servicing of that debt. Um, so more and more people on Main Street will probably be using uh, debt financing and companies like Somalend to go out there and raise capital. Well, I think one of the one answer to that would be the uncertainties in the market are typically in the are in the public market, and the fact that people are are scared to invest in things they don't really understand. I think a lot of the investments that are going to be made in crowdfund investing are going to be investments that people can taste, touch, feel that they know, and they're they're going to be services that they use themselves. I mean, we would our recommendation for people is you should only invest in things that you know, services or products you use, people that you know. This concept that I'm just going to turn on a campaign and there's going to be millions of dollars raining in on me is sort of, uh, that's not going to happen. It, raising money is always hard, and this is just a different way to raise money that's also going to be challenging. Uh, but so I think that I think the, the ability of it to be a local, a local uh, kind of community-based financing is, is one of the things that changes that. And communities doesn't just mean geography. Community can mean, you know, your or, community of origin, background, diaspora, all those things are going to come into play. Um, you're, you're just going to also see that the, the money that we were talking about, people like my parents, with the collapse of the financial markets, took their money out of the markets and are very uh, cautious and they're concerned about putting it back in. But they say to me all the time, you know, uh, we trust you, we know you, we believe in you. If we invest in you, you're, we're sitting down at the Christmas table with you. We know that you're going to be telling us what's going on. So there's a level of trust and confidence that we can develop, this circle of trust, you're going to hear this coming up over and over again as this industry grows, um, whereby we are investing in people that we know, love, and trust, and that trust itself is going to pull money off of the sidelines and into local communities. Now, the powerful thing about that 
is if you study local vesting, and there's a woman by the name of Amy Cortez that wrote a book called Local Vesting, you'll see that for every dollar that's pumped into a local economy, it's got a 3x multiplier. So that means it flows from the, the investor to the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur that hires someone to pay the salary, they pay for products and services to support that business, and they also and that person also plays locally for rent and travel and everything related into that community, as opposed to taking a dollar and buying a, a share of Apple stock, and that money immediately goes off to wherever Apple is. Yeah, so just a follow-up question to that. Um, if I look at Kickstarter, I mean, many of these campaigns are opened up to the public, and money does flood in from all over. I mean, the coffee pot example. So I'm just wondering, why why are you guys convinced that this will be just sort of a local within your own network uh, effect and why wouldn't it why wouldn't money just be coming into a great idea so statistics love statistics <laughs> Um, if you look at any of these uh, these pitches that are funded, you'll see that before one per before anyone gets a dollar of funding from a third party, someone that they're not related to, you have to get all of the money from 30 percent. 30 percent has to come from people in your first degree connectivity. Now, if you've raised capital, you know it is very very hard to get money. People, for one re reason or another, just are not comfortable giving away their money or investing their money. So what this does is it sets a, a, a threshold under which you need to get it. So if you do hit that 30% target, then the chances are you might create um, more of an interest from a broader community. But the fact of the matter still exists that the people that are having the biggest problems, this is not, this is not, this is not solving the problem for tech companies that are looking for capital, period. This is solving a problem for consumer-related products, for people that are not in these Silicon Valley hubs around the country that don't have access to capital. The, the solutions that they are providing to the problems that exist out there are problems in their local communities. That's why they're gonna fund those businesses in those local communities, and that's why we really believe that the greatest impact that this is gonna have is in Main Street America. Also, the, the Kickstarter model, I mean, it's, it's like, it's just like in the rest of the private capital markets, you've got a tool for every type of, uh, of need. And so the contribution model, or the Kickstarter model, is great if you're selling a widget. I mean, the, the, by far the most successful things on Kickstarter are video games and uh, Apple-related products, by far. And so those are things that, that, that people can understand. They have fa fan bases already. That, that, that these companies are typically using Kickstarter as a way to sell a new product line a line extension, a new game, whatever it may be. And so that's typically why a lot of those, those most popular games and most popular uh, things we hear about take place. What is your business model? Who pays, for example, for the rating, rating content? Is it the investor or is it the, the startup? Oh, for the, for the crowdfunding platforms? Yeah. The, uh, it's percentage of the raise, just like uh, Kickstarter. So I think it's about, it'll be between 5 and 10% of the raise. But the cost of capital is going to be a little higher because you're going to have to do the background checks. You're going to have um, the investor relation tools. All these other components that are not necessarily in the perk space model are going to be part of this, uh, this framework. And so the cost of capital will be higher. So um, it's interesting talking about uh, raising capital in the Bay Area because here, I mean, capital is plentiful, right? If you've got a great idea, you've got a prototype, you've got some stuff, you can, you, you, I mean, you all know people who either have gotten funding or you can get funding yourself or maybe you already have funding for a business. But in most parts of the country, there, are, there is no access to capital, none. Um, and so outside of New York and, and Boston and, and, and San Francisco, it doesn't exist. And so this, is, this will absolutely, I think, provide that opportunity. Because, you know, there are a lot of smart people and a lot of smart entrepreneurs in other, other parts of the country and around the world who don't have in this capital-rich environment that we have in the Bay Area. And so I absolutely believe that, that they will be able to not have to move and be able to raise their hand and say, I, I'm worthy of some investment and, and demonstrate that success. I also believe that we would not have had the success that we did if Washington did not believe that this really could create jobs. When we went to, because we didn't have the graphs that 50% of small businesses create jobs and that 1% of capital when we first showed up. But we, we went there with a, with a solution 
they have their constituents calling them, explaining what's going on. So they get it. And if uh, by us showing up and putting our stake in the ground and telling them we've got a solution, not the solution. This is not the silver bullet. This is a solution to a broader problem. They got it. And that's why this was one of the, the highest, uh, most bipartisan bills to go through Congress last year. So it's, you know, the, the beauty about this thing is we're on page four. Jason always says this. I love this. I love this thing. He says, we're, we're on page four of a thousand page novel. Everyone that's getting in right now, everyone that was at that conference last week, they're first movers. These are people that see the momentum of an industry that is building. And I'll tell you something. These are not people that are in their 20s. No offense. Because <laughs> you guys do create a lot and very powerful and we need your voice. But these are 40 year olds and 50 year olds that have built businesses in the past and can't get the capital that they need to grow. And they understand the power that this can have for them. So it's, I think they get it. And these are people with that knowledge and experience that have done it before. So it's going to be exciting to see where we are a year from now. Other questions? The, well, the 800 people, meaning the members of the of the association, a lot of them are uh, are businesses that are looking, are individuals or startups who are looking to build businesses in the space to be part of the ecosystem. Uh, so, crowdfunding platforms, and we know of over 25 crowdfunding platforms that are in some sort of, of stage of being developed right now. Some of them niche, some of them siloed, some of them kind of broad based. And so there's a, there's a lot going on in space. And that, that's just the crowdfunding platforms that doesn't account for how are you going to provide accounting services at scale for these businesses? How are you going to do legal services at scale, due diligence services, investor relations, all those things. So you know, there, there are a lot of businesses that are going to be created. You know, just like in the social, the social web, um, you know, that we that talk a lot about web 2.0. This is web 3.0. This is where you know, the social web meets capital formation. And so they're going to be a whole, the whole ecosystem of businesses that are created. And if you just want to go back to what's going on in Google, about uh, six months ago when we passed this legislation, if you Googled crowdfunding or how many domains have crowdfunding in it, it was about 1,000. Now there's 8,500. Now, those could be businesses. Who knows? But there's a definite movement towards what's happening. So it's the people that the, the industry itself is made up of people, like Jason was saying, that are third party providers and funding portals for it. But there's plenty of entrepreneurs that are saying, how, what is this? What is this? How does it work? How do I get involved? And how do I become part of this community? Have you guys found that the people who are in the state to be able to throw money, to donate, to get companies off the ground, have they taken a specific interest in a specific market or is it nearly just their friends, families who, you know, just want to believe in the person? So you're asking about what traditional angel investors do? I'm wondering about if there's a pattern that you guys have been seeing. Um, like, let's say that I'm from downtown Oakland, right, and I make it big in the entertainment industry singing. And I really want to focus on local communities in downtown Oakland, building up youth, uh, music programs, whatnot. Have you guys seen people with specific interests of wanting to donate to companies and startups that are focusing on specific niches? Or are, you, are they focused solely on donating to family and friends? Well, the, the best example I can give to that, and this goes back to what Jason was talking before when he was talking, you've got communities of origin, interest, geography, and diaspora. Um, they're going to be coming together to help fund these ideas. Uh, we were on the phone recently with a group of doctors that said to us, you know what, we're sick of having to go to venture capitalists that have no clue about the inventions or the science behind what we've developed. And we are, we're, we're smart, we're sophisticated, we've got the capital. How do we build one of these crowdfunding platforms to help crowdfund our own inventions? So I think the answer to your question is, is it, it, it's, gonna, it's happening. It will happen more. You're going to see it in different verticals. Um, and it's going to be, uh, it could be on a platform that just says communities, but it could be a, vert a vertical that just focuses on veterans or mothers or doctors. So 
the question was about, uh, so, so great, you raised money on crowdfunding, what happens when you want to go talk to VCs on Sand Hill Road? Uh, it's a great question. It's an important question. I think that you know, a year ago, I think that uh, most VCs you know, uh, thought this was a, a really bad idea. I think there are a number of them that probably still do. But what we are seeing is angel investors understand that this is deal flow. This is deal flow. This is an opportunity for them to get more deals, more stable, later stage, uh, that, they can, that are lower risk they can make investments in. And so people tend to be against things until they're for them. And so what we'll see is we'll see a couple of companies that are successful in raising money through crowdfunding who have a good exit. And all of a sudden, the people who are against it will be looking for, will begin to look uh, for crowdfunding deals because they, they, are, they are there. I mean, the reason why most companies in the Bay Area are, 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 are most VC deals happen in the Bay Area is because that's where most of the VCs are. There's only so many hours you can spend on a plane and there's so many hours you can spend in a car. And so this allows you to, to source deals from non-traditional places. But no, it's, it's a good question. I think the second part of the answer for me is uh, what VCs do is they, they, they create and solve math problems, right? And they're used to solving math problems with five or 10 investors. This is asking them to solve a new math problem, a math problem that has maybe 100 or 200 investors. And so, yes, it's a little difficult. Yes, it's a little challenging. But uh, they're smart people. They're very smart people who do deals for a living. This is just a new deal structure, and, and, and it'll get figured out. Um, and I think it'll just be a little bit of time. I think the same conversation probably happened 25 years ago uh, when we saw the rise of angel investors, when, when VCs and, and, and investment banks controlled all the capital. And then who are, these, who are these people who've made money somewhere else who think they can make investment decisions? Well, they do a pretty good job, by and large. I mean, angels do have better return rates on average than VCs have in the last you know, decade. And so we, we will see this, well, this will play out now as, as information becomes more liquid, you have the opportunity for, the, for more people to, to benefit from it. And what Jason was talking about in terms of deal flow is critically important. Every one of these, these private capital uh, movers, angels, venture capital, private equity, they're all looking at the same deals in many cases. And they're all trying to figure out what is the best one for them. The point about this is, and we knew that we were onto something because after I sold my company, I put my money into the private equity group that had invested in me. And so Jason and I went to them and we talked to them about what we were doing in this democratizing access to capital. Um, and uh, they got it. And they said to us, you know, if you get this through, you better tell us who are the companies that are getting funded because we want to be follow on money. They got the fact that if the crowd is going to give the validation to a product or service that could be potentially huge, they, it's de-risked. They want to be the second money in so that they can take that company to the next level and give it the expertise and handholding that it needs. Back row. Uh, without any um, invest, uh, large investors, you know, angels involved in, in a company that's crowdsourced, um, where should entrepreneurs look for advisors um, to, to give them the help they need to, to grow their business? Well, I think that one of the, the opportunities is that, I mean, obviously having a board of advisors is, is very important. I think we always certainly recommend that. What this gives you the chance to do is have the ability to look at your investors who may very well be, because just because they're going to be angel investors who choose to make investments through crowdfunding. So those people, those same people may be there because they may not want to make a $100,000 investment. They want to make a $5,000 investment and see how, you, how far you do. So I think that what we'll see is a lot of people who made traditionally larger investments may dabble in some, some smaller plays that will give you access to those, those type of, uh, of advisors earlier in, in the company life. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's give these guys a nice round of applause. It was a great presentation.